All right, even more proof examples here. Um, here is an argument for premises this time and a conclusion to the right of the last premise. Um, oh, you know what? I had wanted to not number these because there shouldn't be any numbers. Um, that was also true for the last one. Uh, I guess I shouldn't be doing this now, but um, doesn't really matter to you. Okay, so here's our example. Um, let's uh, let's figure out the completed proof here. We're trying to derive d, um, so that ultimately is, is going to be the last line of our proof. I should say here that I I've written out seven steps. When you're doing proofs, you won't necessarily know how many steps there are, but kind of for ease of illustration in these um, uh, in these examples, um, I have uh, gone ahead and done that. So strategy-wise, we're trying to derive a D. Um, here is a conditional statement where the D is the consequent of the conditional. So I could use modus ponens to derive the D if I had A by itself on a line. But I don't have A by itself on a line. I have an A here, but that's embedded in a complex uh, statement, right? So again, the strategy I suggest is to start with either atomic or, or atomic negated uh, statements and see how we can plug those in uh, to, to anything else in our premises to derive some new line that will help us get to our conclusion. So Let's start with the not G. Um, you see not G is the antecedent of this conditional on line 1. And if I have a conditional on one line and an antecedent of that condition, conditional on another line, then I can derive um, the consequent of that conditional, in this case A or B. What rule is that? Well. You should know the rule by now if you've been practicing, but the rule is modus ponens. Don't get confused, it's not modus tollens. It's modus ponens on lines 1 and 4. Again, just because there's a negation, let's go back to these really quickly. Um, here's modus ponens, right? The form says if you have a conditional and the antecedent of that conditional, then you can derive the consequent. Again, this is just the form. The, the statements themselves could be complex. They, the statements Q, for example, could be a negated statement, or P could be a negated statement. So don't get confused. It's not going to be modus tollens just because there are negations involved, right? In this case, there is a negation involved because the antecedent is uh, not G, right? There is the antecedent. Here is not G. But this is still just modus ponens, okay? All right. Uh, what can I do now? Well, uh, <clears throat> again, this is going to take practice and creativity on your part, but what uh, strikes me now is this other negated atomic uh, statement, not B. And if I look at this and line 5, then I should see that I can apply one of my uh, rules or valid forms of argument in order to derive something with lines 2 and 5. And that something is a. And the rule that I used to derive A uh, from lines 2 and 5 was a disjunctive syllogism, which I'll abbreviate DS, again, on lines 2 and 5. Now, um, I have derived A, so I can help myself to this again anything that I've any of the premises and any of things the things that I've derived from the premises I can use in deriving further further lines of my proof so I've just derived a um, and of course if I look at line 3 I've got a conditional statement where the antecedent is a and you should know what uh, rule I can use to derive the conclusion D right just another case of modus ponens on lines 3 and 6.